I think the um, yeah, in terms of the Philippines, I, I maybe I'll just sort of start a little bit. Um, DFID was holding, um, probably a lot of you are aware, uh, an, a large event in November um, to look at violence against women and girls in um, <coughs> in emergencies and to it was a call to action. Um, it's called Keep Her Safe, and the idea was to bring together um, NGOs and uh, UN agencies and um, and donors, and to really look at how we could improve response. Um, from the first phase of emergencies. Um, and so that, that was really kind of looking at what are the major blockages and how can we improve the response. Um, and it happened to coincide um, with, uh, with this enormous emergency in the Philippines, um, which gave us all an opportunity <coughs> to practice what we were discussing about. Um, I think I think the Philippines is quite a good example of why it's important not to focus exclusively on um, on rape uh, in um, and and rape by armed actors. Obviously, it wasn't it was a natural disaster. We do see um, in natural disasters that there are increases in violence against women and girls and increases in all kinds of protection risks. Um, and if you're not looking sort of more broadly at the protection. Um, at the protection environment, then you're missing. You're going to be missing a lot of risks and missing a lot of uh, a lot of critical ways of preventing violence. Um, so, I mean, in terms of some of the, um, and Aisha can speak more directly because I know she was um, assessing in the field. I was a little bit more distant. I was in Tacloban, but um, but I wasn't deep field. <laughs> um, but the um, the I think. Some of the some of the things that were sort of specific to the Philippines, of course, you had this massive destruction of of um, of people's homes. Um, so there's a lack of lighting. Um, there's lack of places for women to bathe, to change. Uh, lack of places for anyone to bathe or change or um, or toilet. Um, lack of shelter and the shelters, the evacuation centers that were in use were extremely overcrowded. Um, very hard to kind of safeguard against people coming and going. Um, again, lighting was a major issue, um, and then of course people just lacking um, the basic means of survival. And although there was a big push to try and get assistance in very rapidly, there were a lot of logistical blockages. Um, it was very difficult to even get in for the first little while, um, and uh, and then to get things on the ground and to get things delivered was was quite a challenge. So, um, so what that what that means is that there were a lot of people exposed to to opportunistic sexual assault um, but also I mean a, um, just a, a, a lot of possible exploitation um, so you saw um, children begging <coughs> uh, in the streets which puts them you know separated from parents puts them at risk of, of people taking advantage of them um, no police that were available. Remember that all of the people, of course, that worked in the area, all of the police, all of the social services, all of the all of those people were also traumatized, had lost their homes. Um, and while the government did try to bring other people from other parts of the country in, that was also not the fastest process. Um, so, and and then there was a uh, quite a big concern as well around um, around trafficking, um, which is which is an issue I think in the Philippines. Um, and the, there's quite a strong anti-trafficking agency there um, to try and prevent the exploitation, both for labor and for sex, but to prevent the, the exploitation of people who are looking for overseas jobs or who are looking to, um, to find ways to, to better themselves or to, um, to replace what they've lost. Um, a lack of general information, I think, from the first phase uh, was one of the big one of the big challenges, and just people really overwhelmed by um, by what needed to be done. There was a, just a huge amount, and as usual, of course, the population itself was the first uh, the first responder um, and had and and did an enormous amount in terms of getting things cleaned up so that assistance could be brought in. Um, we talk a lot, and I think we. Um, I mean, we talk a lot about the importance of providing specialized services and getting and getting those services in place quite early um, in emergencies. And there w there was a big push to get things like child friendly spaces and and women friendly spaces where people can go, um, children can go to be safe and to have spaces to play. Women can go to be with other women and to um, to report any 
um, any issues to be referred to and to just have a space where they, where they feel safe. It's hard to establish those places when everything is in a state of, of complete disarray. So that took a bit of time to put in place. Um, and then and then I think one of the one of the critical issues, you know, we we had a lot of discussions about, um, you know, for even from the beginning, sort of, well, we we can't prioritize. We really need to prioritize the basic needs: food, water, shelter, etc. Um, and then it's it's always an interesting dynamic because I've seen a lot of these conversations where people are talking about um, about GBV in the first phases of an emergency, and they say, well, you know, why do we always emphasize these things? Well, realistically, one of the first and most crucial things for um, for protection in the first phase is going to be shelter. If you don't have shelter, you don't have a barrier between you and the outside world, you don't have somewhere you can change in privacy, you don't have any way to protect yourself against, um, against theft, against uh, attack. Um, if you don't have private bathing areas or somewhere that you can go to bathe in privacy, you're, you're exposed to the outside world, you're, you're at risk of opportunistic attack. So those basic services, I think, are are really crucial and it's one of the things that we focused on was to try to make sure that the basic services that we were supporting was really looking at, um, at making sure that there was an integrated response so that you know medical facilities that are provided actually have the wherewithal to to treat women who present with um, or children who present with um, as, as survivors of, of some form of abuse um, that, that shelter is being looked at in a way that provides the maximum protection um, and that that um, that other forms of you know that we that we get people the means of subsistence as quickly as possibly as possible to avoid um, avoid what we already saw happening even within two or three weeks of the emergency, which was um, was prostitution, survival sex, um, even among children, um, and and to try and to try and cut that back before it started. Um, I might, I'm talking a lot, so I might, um, <laughs> I might let Aisha, because she, you probably have comments on that as well. Um, so maybe I'll let Aisha pick up from there. Thanks, Clea. 